Okay, I think uh, we can start. We have the daunting task of uh, winning over the lunch uh, <laughs> aftermath or also the, the prolonged lunch. But anyway, uh, we can always innovate on that as well and, uh, and be good. Thank you so much for coming here. In the uh, panel for innovation, industry, and human brain project and eBrains. Um, I have uh, uh, the pleasure of uh, working on this panel with an amazing set of uh, a complex individuals that hit pretty much all of them, all the elements of, uh, of the main concept of the panel, innovation and industry. I'll present, uh, I'll say a few words for everyone, and then we'll start the, the questioning. Um, uh, first of all, and, and uh, uh, I'll do it alphabetically, the way uh, uh, they are, uh, we have Enric Claverol, uh, to my right, uh, who is the Program Manager for Medical Technologies and Medical Devices for the European Innovation Council. Uh, Enric has had uh, a very uh, varied uh, experience and, and life so far. Uh, he has been uh, an academic. He has been uh, a, a leader and founder of uh, more than one uh, startup companies until he saw the light, may I say, or something, and he went on the other side. And he is now on policy and, and helping others do what, what he has achieved. So a very uh, a varied uh, background. Uh, do we have uh, uh, Martha Kuna Maluf Bergman is the only one who unfortunately could not be here with us uh, in, per in person, but we have her. Excellent. Very good to see you, uh, Martha. Uh, Martha is Director of Regulatory Affairs in Edwards Life Sciences, a major corporation that does uh, a lot of, uh, develops a lot of technology, especially for, uh, for uh, cardiac things, but also not only. Uh, she has been uh, dealing with digital health. The digital aspect is a major part of, of what she does, and she's dealing with strategy and so on. And I have to admit, and I really like that, she's also an artist. So uh, we'll be hearing uh, that perspective from her uh, uh, as well. Christian Meyer, at the, at the very end of, of this panel, is also a mixed uh, person. He's an academic. He's a professor. In the previous session, he presented all the great things that he has done in, in Spinnaker, one, two, three, maybe four, five, and, and who knows. <laughs> uh, but he's also a founder of uh, uh, a great uh, spin-off of, of this effort and a startup and, and, uh, and working with that. Uh, continuing on, uh, we have Stefan Nickel, uh, uh, two, two positions <laughs> to my right, uh, who comes, uh, he's a head of product management from Kaltzeis Multisem, uh, GmbH. <laughs> and uh, he's also, uh, a hybrid, as we were discussing uh, before. He has been with Kaltzeis uh, for quite some time, uh, doing wonderful things in, in terms of having one thing that was developed for one purpose and repurposing it. But also he has been for about 10 years as an academic, as a researcher, I should say, and then uh, also in industry, but also, uh, and it's very important for innovation, uh, uh, on the venture capital side. So he has been, uh, uh, he brings this perspective as well. And last but not least, our, our very own uh, Stephen Vermeulen, who is the Director of Innovation in the Human Brain Project and also the Chief Information Infrastructure Officer in eBrains uh, AISBL, who has had, again, a, a long trip uh, uh, in, in industry, being in major companies, having his own company, consulting uh, for startups and, and innovation pathways uh, and so on. I hope I didn't miss any major highlight for any of you, but it's a great pleasure to, to have you all here. And so let's, uh, let's entertain uh, the audience with, uh, 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 with uh, a whole bunch of interesting things about innovation. 
So as Wizzy says, I'll be asking a question to one of you, then others may be uh, jumping in, and then we'll see how the whole thing flows. And this is, you know, the HPP Summit, so I have to start with something intimately related to, to HPP. So, Stephen, uh, uh, you kind of maybe alluded to that um, uh, earlier, but uh, it's, it's uh, eBrains, the HPP, and through the infrastructure eBrains has developed a whole bunch of products that uh, have the potential uh, of, of uh, uh, doing the transfer of technology and, and uh, uh, being innovation uh, targets. Uh, I mean, we had in the morning, you know, four innovation awards, two for this year, two for last year. Um, from your understanding, what it would take for eBrains to actually spin out uh, or spin off, depending, it's, it's uh, not, not very important here, uh, a company out of this? Uh, how how much we as a community of neuroscientists and digital scientists and, and so on and so forth are ready to take this step and how eBrains is ready to support this? It's a, <clears throat> it's a big question, of course. <laughs> it's a, so we, we need you to You have be, 30 seconds. So. Yes, so <laughs> that, that, therefore, uh, let, me, let me just, uh, I'll, I'll touch upon a couple of the points here. Um, Saying eBrains spins out, that is one, I, w I definitely want to answer that question, but I think we need to, uh, as uh, eBrains is, is basically supporting um, a, s a whole wide branch of science. There is lots of ideas coming out of that. There will be spin outs out of that. We have already spin outs. There are some new spin outs mentioned. So this is happening uh, today, and obviously we need to provide support there. I think that is very obvious, and that was said this morning as well. Um, there is more possible, uh, but um, we lack, let's say, uh, enough support um, in different areas. I mean, it's not all something that, uh, that eBrains can support, but for instance, neuroscience is not seen in the technology transfer offices by some of, in some of the universities, not in all of them. I don't have to generalize, but it's definitely not always seen as a source for innovation. Where it is, I mean, it is really gonna have societal impact. What, it, what, we, what, what you guys are doing will have societal impact, and that is important. So that's where we need support, and that's in different areas. On the other side, um, I think the scientists also need to understand that they need to ask for that support. That is also important, because you can't do this on your own. Um, and I think one example I would say is ask, ask the people that have won the award how they went through that experience and, and, and go through that. Now, I come back to the, to the, the other question. Um, because it's important as well, would eBrains as a research infrastructure at a certain moment spin out the company itself? There would be some use cases where that could be needed because eBrains as a research infrastructure is of course supporting many different things and that is a collection of services for instance that could be valuable for industry, for, um, um, for other areas. Um, and in that sense, it could be at a certain moment um, needed. Um, it's a bit too early to do that because we are still yeah, in infancy as a, as a research infrastructure. Uh, but that is definitely, there are examples with other research infrastructures, so that's definitely something that should be on our radar. Um, but the use cases there for me are clearly when it goes beyond research. Um, because research is what we do, that's the nature of the research infrastructure, that's what we support, it has to be as much as possible free. Industry need, has other needs. There is, a, there is a need for secrecy, trade secrets, uh, there is a need for quality, um, and so then it would also have, it would also come with a cost, so it co comes with a price. So that's, that makes sense. But that's, that's like how I, uh, how I look at these things. Creating that company is not difficult. Getting the community behind it is more difficult. It has to be aligned. So, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I've used my more than 30 seconds. Yeah, that, that was a joke. I mean, <laughs> 30 minutes of an answer is not good, but you know. <laughs> Christian, you want to chime in? Yeah, um, so actually from the experience of the last two years, and uh, you said industry has different needs. So uh, um, one of the big things you need in a company is freedom to operate. And freedom to operate means for the VCs to be able to invest in the company, the, uh, the company's total control of its IP. And this has been one, sorry, major hurdle in the Human Brain Project with uh, SpinCloud Systems 
we actually needed to contact 100 partners and get their individual agreements on all this stuff. So this is uh, one thing I would give as homework for eBrains. This procedure needs to be streamlined. We spent 150k euros on lawyer fees, which is basically burning through your entire seed financing just to get the IP inside the company. So we did it, now we're through, it's all good, but uh, we definitely need to streamline this. And maybe even, uh, speaking of EIC, maybe even at a European level, because uh, Spinnik IP has been developed in several European projects, also in EFRA grants, also in BMBF grants, of course, and all of those contracts had different stipulations when it comes to IP, when it comes to rights and whatnot, and overlaying them and finding a loophole there in which to get the IP to the company that's in agreement with all of those contracts has not been easy. So kind of giving a best practice example at a European level on how IP transfer and these kind of contracts could work for projects might be a very good idea, giving them a template basically which to follow. So you're saying that instead of dealing with 150 partners, if you dealt with only with eBrains ASBL, let's say, it would have been much smoother. Exactly. The, the just one partner would be good. And again, if you spread out over, I mean, usually the stuff we do is not just done from one project, right? So it's two, three projects. They all have different consortium agreements, different stipulations. So again, a best practice contract or best practice example on a European level that new projects should follow in order to make this whole getting IP out of project uh, kind of more streamlined would be very helpful. Enric, when can we have something like this? <laughs> the IP transfer is always an issue. Even if you don't have that many partners, the institution, the academic institutions, sometimes make life difficult. Uh, it's a good idea. I think this is something we can develop a bit further at the AC. We can talk about this. There is ongoing work on this, um, trying to simplify the IP part, but there's a lot to be done still. But again, it's not just the partners executing the project. Sometimes it's institution behind it who says, oh, no, 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 there is an asset here, there's value. I want to be there. And then the VCs say, no, 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 I don't want to have the academic institution part of this. And sometimes this blocks the, the starting point. So I do agree there is work to be done. Um, the other thing is that I wanted to mention during the discussion that you know, answering the, the initial question, if you want to set up a company, there are resources, you've been through this already, but maybe some colleagues here are starting to put together an idea. The EAC is just one of the resources, the accelerator program. So this is something that you could look into. Um, so as you know, we invest, we take a minority position only, and we invest up to 15 million. And there's also a non-dilutive part, this is a grant. So I would encourage you to look into this as a way to continue towards the patient, what you've done during the HPP. One Actually, thing that- uh, uh, Spin Cloud Systems has a transition grant. What's that again? We've got a transition grant. Very good, yes. So we have like a three-stage pipeline. We have the Pathfinder program, which is about 4 million euros, and this is for early stage development. And then we have this bridge funding from Pathfinder to Accelerator. And then it's really a bridge funding. So if you have a proof of concept, but you don't have something that you think the private sector would invest in very quickly, then you have this bridge, it's 2.5 million euros, and you have two, three, four years to polish the product. And then you can jump into the accelerator, which is the, the flagship for us. So up to 50 million plus 2.5 non-dilutive. Maybe one thing I wanted to mention, and I, and I pass on the, uh, the stage to somebody else. This is really, really important. What we're seeing is you have to be able to explain very well, not just your science, but but the, the impact, the application in the market, in, in, the, you know, in, the, in the clinical setting. We, we see this a lot of, lots of times where the science is very strong and sometimes we struggle to communicate exactly what is the value for the patient. So I would encourage you to look at the transition and the accelerator program and also to try to think in terms how the VCs think many times, what's really valuable for the patient as opposed to what's the exciting science behind it. Continue with you. I mean, maybe you're, you give the first uh, uh, step in the answer. What are the attributes the AIC is looking for in order to invest in a, in a startup? And uh, maybe looking for the patient is, is one of them, but what others there may be. And also, do you see anything specific that should come up uh, when we talk about uh, 
applications that come out of the human brain project or that come out of you know the neuroscientific realm so the the agency was created as a vehicle to help grow european tech companies so my answer here will be really common sense you can guess before i say it so the company should have a strong technology that clearly has a need that was the, the comment i made before that's that's a must that must be a market for it just as you can imagine and it's it should be something that the private sector can join you in bringing to market an executive team we see this all the time accelerator in particular uh, is very very competitive and, and and we get to see teams that are really really strong with a lot of industrial experience so that's also important so around your idea once you're comfortable with technology you have you see the opportunity you can see the the, the patient the clinician at the end of the tunnel using it now you need to assemble my recommendation would be to assemble a very strong team around this and sort of think in terms of how industry creates products that are successful as opposed to how academia creates a strong academic team. But I think these are like two different uh, environments and you, you have to think from this other angle. Thank you. Uh, does anyone want to, to complement this or shall I move in the... I can just comment on the, on the IP level. It's very good to, um, to start off a project when all these... Sorry. It's a, it's a good idea to start these big projects already when most of the cards are already lying on the table. So people know and understand what it means. Um, if IP is generated at a certain point of time, what to do and what the rules are. And not to just develop and do fancy stuff and exciting science and then afterwards try to find a way to commercialize it. It helps a lot to keep that in mind already from the beginning and, and also put, and, and put out clear rules. Uh, so, so that people know where to go. And, and just what you mentioned before, 150,000 is a lot of money. Most probably you could have saved some of that um, right from the beginning if you would have known what and how to do and, and, and whom to talk to. Um, that can be organized and should be part of it. You know, It would, I think, not, not mean too much to, to, to ask for this from right from the beginning to get that set up. Uh, I think whoever has tried to cross the Death Valley from the research side uh, to, the, to, to the industry, to the innovation side, knows that the technological challenges are dwarfed by the legal challenges, the business challenges, and so on and so forth. And, and us scientists are, are not ready. I mean, for some of them, you know, I mean, the Google founders or the Facebook founders had it in them, although they were scientists. But most of us don't have it, and, and we need the different... Uh, of course, some of you have transitioned this from one to the other, and it's great to have you here. Um, uh, Stefan, uh, I mean, you, you've been a venture capitalist, you've seen this, you are in a big company, you, you have been a researcher. Where do you think can we expect the most innovation or, or the, the, the best innovation to come out? In a larger setting or, 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 in, or in a smaller setting? I mean, is, is the university the, the best place or former startup and that's the innovation will come? Or can you be innovative in a major corporation like Tice or Siemens or whatever? Well, I, I hope you're innovative at Tice. <laughs> what else <laughs> can, can I say? But you know what? It depends very much on the state you are in with your project and also on the project size. So what, what I see inside size, some of these project, projects uh, which are running sometimes for 20 years, maybe 25 years, and, and cost a lot of money, would not have happened in an university environment or within the startup. No, I don't think that would have happened. Others um, are, I think, and it's a, it's a give and take always. Um, what, what is a joint denominator? It is the people. The people in a certain phase realize they have an idea and to push a business or an idea to a certain limit inside a startup is very good because what normally industry is, industry is very slow and it takes much longer than you expect. Inside a startup you are flexible, you only have to do with a few people, regulations are much less, but at a certain point you need to do this transition and, and jump out and maybe open up also to many investors 
or to some, or even to go into the, to, uh, the big industry and ask them for help. So, unfortunately, I don't have a clear answer. It really depends on your, on your project you have, on your product you want to develop, or on your service, and on the overall project size. Not having a clear answer is a very clear answer of the <laughs> diversity of, of the possibilities. So, so that's, uh, Christian, what is your experience? I mean, university, now a startup. Where do you um, feel more innovative? Maybe a slightly different take on that. Um, I actually like, you need to pull yourself out of a comfort zone which on the academic level means you go in at, a, uh, at an area from the side, you really go interdisciplinary. Now we're all talking interdisciplinary, but you really have to take that seriously. Develop a common language with someone not from your field, work on joint projects, because this is where the real innovation comes in. And for that, you already need to leave your comfort zone. And for the transition, of course, to a startup, you seriously need to leave your comfort zone. So you really need to be able to find this new thinking inside of you and, and carry that to the, to the outside. And then it doesn't really matter. Big projects are cool for exactly getting inspiration, getting this interdisciplinary. But then, of course, once you have this initial idea, I mean, it's, again, it's 1% inspiration, 99% transpiration, then you really, in a small team, need to pull this through. And this is what the environment, be that at a big company in size or at the university side, needs to support, essentially. Does anyone else want to comment on this special uh, kind of uh, potent for innovation in, interdis in interdisciplinary work? Well, <laughs> I mean, my experience is similar. Uh, I've been in big companies. I've been in, 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 in small startups. Um, I think the kind of innovation you can do is different. In a big company, you can feel the, feel the bigger budget and you typically are able to innovate upon what the company is already doing. If you're going to change the business model of that company, you won't do it in that company. That's the kind of things. But, I mean, you can, you can be disruptive with a startup. Uh, you can be, um, you can be um, evolutionary with a startup. There is, there is no rule. And I think that's, that's a, bit, a bit of danger if you talk about innovation to put things into boxes is dangerous because it's all unique. It is innovation. Um, so, but I, I, I totally agree. It all is around the, basically the team and, and a team that is willing to go to very extremes uh, to, to get things done. Because um, bringing that back to, to what we are here from, uh, I mean, in, in, in the Human Brain Project, if you think about a, an innovation, very often it will go to a medical type of application. Uh, we talk about patient data, GDPR. Oh, it's already a big hurdle uh, to work with that. Uh, we talk about medical application, level four, level two, level one. I mean, the administration around that and the, the slowness around that, you have to have enormous courage and patience to do that. And that is, I mean, if you look at that, big hurdles. What, what is the team that really is willing to push through those hurdles? That's the ones that are going to make it. And it's not, it doesn't have to be in the scientist. There's nothing bad about that. that, that that's the other thing. You, you don't have to really go to a startup, but if you think it's valuable, find people that are willing to do it. I think that is an important aspect as well. Take it up, yeah. Great, great. Yes, Enric, please. Yeah, the other thing I, I see all the time, so clearly in the startup, you're, you're free to pursue what you want to pursue at least in theory, because when you look at the startups coming from other economies, they have one order of magnitude more capital to play. And it's sometimes a bit unfair, I think, in Europe when you, when you ask a spin-off to be as innovative as somebody who has a factor of 20 more capital. So I think this is something we have to work on together quite a lot in Europe. I mean, you have to, I mean there are no miracles. You can be a little bit smarter than the competitor. Okay, that's fine. But you cannot be 20 times smarter. You have to have 20 times more resources. So I think we need to pool resources, take a little bit more risk. I mean, the EAC is helping, but just a small part of the economy. Very, very good point. Yes. Um, let me come back to, uh, to our home, Human Brain Project, eBrains, and so on and be a little more specific about where, where we can go. Uh, Martha, uh, it's uh, 
uh, and not because I'm leading WP5, but modeling and simulation is a big part of what uh, this infrastructure is about. Uh, uh, simulating a whole bunch of things that are happening in the brain. And, and uh, what do you think the role is in neuroscience? Uh, uh, I mean, I'm, I spoke as a digital person. And, and more in particular, what is the potential uh, of uh, uh, computational modeling and simulation neuroscience to lead innovation and, and change the lives of, of people uh, in terms of how they create and, and uh, their health? Yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here today uh, with you, even remotely. Uh, I hope that you hear me well. Um, yes. Well, yes, uh, yes. Yeah, computational modeling and simulation have become an uh, essential tool in neuroscience research and even in cardiovascular research. And they play a crucial role in understanding the complex functions of the brain or, or the cardiovascular system by using any mathematical or computational methods the, the researchers can simulate and analyze the behavior of individual neurons networks or, or entire brain regions or the entire circulatory systems uh, to give you more examples but uh, one major application of uh, of uh, computer modeling and simulation called uh, normally in silico uh, modeling um, is the study of the mechanisms uh, underlying neural processing and information integration. For example, many researchers can use models to investigate uh, how neural activities patterns emerge uh, from interactions between individual neurons and how these patterns contribute to cognitive functions such as the perception, decision-making, the memory, etc. The in silico technologies can also help researchers uh, to understand the neural basis uh, uh, or, or, and, and to combine with uh, relationships with other part of the, of the um, body, the human body, um, uh, governed by the, by the brain, right? So one example is the interaction between the neuroscience and the cardiovascular science as well. And that, that is why, why I am here. Um, computational model can be uh, also uh, to develop, to evaluate new treatments for both cardiovascular and neuro, neurological disorders uh, associated to one each other. Uh, in, as an example, I can give you that the researchers could use models to study uh, effects of hypertension, diabetes, or a stroke or, or brain function, uh, and to develop new treatments uh, that target both of cardiovascular and neurological aspects of the diseases. Um, and, or, overall, in silico technologies, com uh, Combining uh, uh, in neuroscience and cardiovascular science can provide a really a powerful tool for understanding the complex interactions between the brain and the cardiovascular system, and for developing new treatments for a wide range of diseases that affect both systems. As well, there are a lot of studies that demonstrate that there are uh, interactions between cardiovascular system uh, the neuro, uh, neurological system and uh, um, uh, the, uh, um, uh, um, the functions on, on, on the inflammation, and this is related to um, rheum rheumatic diseases in general. Uh, there are many studies that I've, I've been studying um, for a long time already, um, and where I do research is in the... Um, um, in the vagus nerve, and uh, there are studies uh, related to uh, auricular uh, vagus nerve stimulation that uh, de demonstrate the, the capabilities to, to govern the regions in the brain uh, and where um, it can um, act in, into the inflammatory systems and to damper the inflammation. So there are a lot of possibilities uh, the, there are a lot of studies that can corroborate what I'm saying today, and, 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 um, but what uh, mainly I advocate uh, in this kind of forum is that, that the, 
a partnership between uh, uh, um, universities specialized in neuroscience or specialized in, in uh, cardiovascular diseases uh, could uh, collaborate as well, right? Um, I'm also representing the Avicenna Alliance that is a, um, a non-profit organization created by the European Commission, but is, um, is uh, 50% uh, um, represented by the human um, the BPHI institutes, yeah, uh, uh, and 50% from, from the companies, uh, the medtech and the pharma companies. And in this organization, we really promote the, the good simulation practices. We promote the um, acceptance and adoption of in silico uh, evidence in the regulatory pathway but as well promote the collaboration between companies uh, and, and universities, small, medium companies and big companies as well, members of our, of our organization. So the key uh, for me is to, that there are a lot to do. Uh, uh, computer modeling and simulation is a, poten is a really powerful uh, tool that in combination with cloud services, in combination with, uh, uh, with artificial intelligence, and, uh, uh, and also uh, in combination with the high-performance high computers or in the future quantum computers, uh, that, that tool will, will really revolution, revolutionize the, the, the innovation system. Great, yeah. great. The mystic message, anyone wants to I have a compliment? question. Yeah. Um, possibly this is for Edwards or Zeiss. Um, so out of the HPP um, group of projects, there are many ideas and new technologies. And so your companies have the opportunity to support long-term research projects that eventually need to bring a product to market, I assume. So what will be your thoughts about how our colleagues here could um, join you in the effort somehow. What kind of model of collaboration do you think can bring value to the assets they have created? In addition to the purely academic collaborations, I'm thinking, okay, they have a, an idea of a company in their minds. They have to extract some, val extract some value from those ideas in the form of a company. You also have to extract some value. What will be the best model for them to get in touch and join your research program but towards a startup? Are there any models you've seen running in your environments that you would say, okay, that could be relevant for the, for the audience? Martha and then Stefan. Do you have any thoughts on this? Well, there are um, uh, models uh, in, in simulation, um, combination of models as well, um, that, that can be ap applied and to bring uh, solutions and new therapies or, or drugs or, or medical devices that can help patients. Um, first of all, the, the models need to be center patient, right? And, and the models need to be, um, um, uh, we always talk about data-driven models, uh, but they need to uh, have a high quality of data um, to fit those models. But we can, um, uh, uh, let's say, we can um, create models that can, as, a, as I mentioned before, can, can interrelate the neuroscience and cardiovascular diseases, for example. Well, and neuroscience and in the study of the nervous system uh, and, and the cardiovascular research, by the other hand, uh, in, in the study of the heart, of the circulatory system, uh, can be combined in, in a model, physiological model, um, 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 can be mathematical models uh, uh, supporting as well, and, and we can determine the uh, interactions between the, the brain and, and the heart, because they are intrinsically uh, or intricately uh, linked uh, with the brain regulating many of the heart functions, such as the heart rate and the blood pressure. Research in neuroscience has helped uh, to uncover the mechanisms by which the brain controls the heart and how these disruptions in this communication can lead to the cardiovascular disease. Uh, one simple cardiovascular disease is, is, the, is the, blood, the high blood pressure. 
studying the effects of stress on cardiovascular health, for example, where the stress is known to be a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And neuroscience uh, or neuroscientists have been instrumental uh, in this field to identify the brain regions and pathways involved in the stress response on how chronic stress can lead the development of cardiovascular diseases. So I guess so, it's a potential. It's a lot of potential, yeah. a lot of potential. Thank you. Stefan? I, I understood your question more into bringing the right people together. So, so how to do this is, you know, at size we are 30,000 plus people working now in different disciplines. It's not, it's not so straightforward. Uh, we, we also, um, and, and larger companies do that, we try to mimic these environments you have, let's say at institutes or universities, we have um, development teams which do advanced development research, we have even venture funds inside size um, to find the right people for, um, let's say, the right projects is a challenge. And this needs dialogue. Um, you need to reach out from both sides, one reason why I'm also here. Um, you need to meet somewhere in the middle and, and try to start talking and at the right moment in time do something and uh, yeah, put money where your mouth is. And, and this, is, this is the challenge uh, because in, in, at the university level, let's say, or, or doing research, you, you are willing to take a high risk because you, you're willing to, to go for maybe a nature paper and you understand that you, you need to do something very fancy to get in there. This is your goal. Um, at, the, at the industry, you're not so willing. You want to see the most, let's say, bang for the buck at low risk. And, and somewhere you need to uh, yeah, um, re reach somewhere an agreement and meet somewhere maybe in the middle and then take it from there. Finding the right people at the right moment with the right momentum it's art. My limited exposure to, to venture capitalists and so on for some ventures, they were talking about some of them anyway, four Ps in, in the product and profitability. And, and one of them is people. And, and the P of people is capital P. Uh, it, it's all about people. Then the rest will come if you have the right people. Otherwise, no matter how you try. <laughs> Stephen, yes. Yeah, I think, I mean, we've said it already, people is important, but even before you are thinking of bringing that team together and, and executing, it's also th this dialogue that you were talking about is important because it's difficult from an academic point of view to understand the potential value of what you have in industry. And it's difficult from industry to understand what is happening in academia, what is the value for us. And that's where uh, this is this, you, you talked about the value of that there. Uh, we, know, we all know that. Let's, let's build a bridge there but, and come from two sides. But that's also a dialogue. And that's why there has to be a lot of talking. Because this is, it's not going to, I mean, it's not going to happen by reading papers. It's, it's not going to happen automatically. It is also people there that have to really bridge that. And that's even before we're building a team to, to actually execute. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, Christian? Actually, uh, people-wise, uh, uh, when I talk to Giacomo Indiveri, for example, in Zurich, uh, he says, I have two major outputs. It's basically a neuromorphic concept, but it's the graduates. And this is a very true statement. What comes out of academia is really the manpower to fire up all these startups. Uh, one, one case in point, for example, on Fabrice's slides, he had this big team from his neuromotics uh, lab. And I noticed uh, Mahmoud Akel there, uh, uh, he was also mentioned, he comes out of the TU Munich. He's now one of the first uh, employees at Spin Cloud Systems. So we're hiring like crazy. And we're of course hiring in this community here because they understand the system, they understand the concepts. So uh, this is a major output also of, not all of you will end up in academia. I mean, professor positions are limited. But there are so many interesting startups now happening where your concepts could be really driven. I mean, you don't even have to do the startup yourself, but you could be a major part in the early phase of the startup, bring in your ideas and really getting this stuff into practice. So that's kind of also my, my appeal to all of you. Um, not just think about things just in this academic way. Really also scan the startup scene and see if something there matches up to your interests. That's great. That's great. 
Um, I would actually have please. one more question to Martha. Yes, please. Um, so uh, I showed earlier for Spinnaker 2, like uh, how we're doing this individualized uh, drug discovery, patient-specific drugs. Now, uh, of course, in this community here, uh, kind of patient-specific brain simulation, could this be a selling point? I've seen some work from the virtual brain model where they do patient-specific uh, Alzheimer pattern simulation. Uh, do you see a way in which, for example, Spinnaker, this kind of rapid fire simulation, could be utilized, let's say Alzheimer again. We do individual scanning of patients, simulation of patients. Can we derive individualized treatments from that? Sure, sure, because the, the, the purpose is to, is to uh, simulate not only the physiological uh, um, uh, aspects of the patient, uh, but as well to simulate uh, uh, a specific uh, doses of a, a, of a drug, for example, or to simulate a specific uh, el electro um, uh, stimulation if it is a medical device. So uh, actually simulation uh, brings uh, a lot of possibility fr from simulating the entire body or simulating dosages from, from drugs or simulating uh, um, um, electro um, uh, uh, stimulation or simulating um, in an ICD, for example, uh, a specific uh, quantity of uh, energy to be uh, given to to provoke a shock in, in, in the heart of a patient. So there are many, many possibilities and simulation, and this is the power of, of a computer, computational modeling and simulation. Um, you can even simulate uh, in medical devices, even simulate the uh, how to um, uh, produce uh, better uh, performance in the batteries of the implantable medical devices. So, uh, and, 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 and I can be hours uh, uh, giving you examples of what simulation can bring. So if you, if you ask me, uh, uh, can we produce uh, uh, or simulate treatments? Yes, we can simulate treatments. If you go to talk with uh, companies uh, that uh, work in, um, in, in cancer research, for example, and they uh, uh, work a lot with the immunotherapies or immunotherapies, um, they use simulation. Right, and in order to find the correct therapy for a, for the uh, uh, one single patient, and 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 this is uh, fantastic to see the results because this is the the key of uh, personalized uh, medicine, right? There you go, tremendous potential. Uh, we talked about interdisciplinarity. Now we see a lot in, in terms of computational uh, modeling and simulation, lots of potential. Uh, we have the purely or almost purely uh, technological uh, uh, spin offs. Stephen, from your understanding of HPP, is there any winner in terms of where can you expect most of the innovation from the technology side, digital side, or from the neuroside or anything in between there is uh, there is obviously no clear winner um, I think um, if we if we dissect it a bit I think technology is maybe um, I need to be a bit careful with my words but okay bear with me maybe a bit easier um, because um, you have not these hurdles of um, doing a medical device and stuff like that, unless it's a medical device technology, of course. Um, so already there, that, that's where it already breaks down. Um, and it's, it's also more accepted. I think that's what we typically see. There's still this, this, um, uh, this idea of, um, yeah, technology startup is, is a bit easier. I'm not saying it easy. It is easy, by the way. Don't, don't, don't. But I think the, the impact on society is much higher when we talk about um, the biomedical side of things. And I think there's also a shift where, where you would say, okay, a technology company 
you have to really think about scale to really, I mean, for an, for an investor to be interesting, you have to really talk, think about scale. You wouldn't be um, getting investment if you haven't shown how this is going to scale up and that you have multiple customers. The ideal thing would be something that a user is carrying with him and, and do an innovation on that. That's an ideal technology company because it's huge. Um, but when you do something with humans, eventually, um, that is huge because it's everywhere. Um, so the impact on, on society is a lot bigger and you see already, um, and I think that uh, the others can definitely uh, uh, be more precise on that, but you see already that um, the way VCs look at this is they are not, they, they're doing their own calculation. They, 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 they want from the startup to know what is the societal impact and then they will do their calculation on, the, on what multiple they're going to get out of that. They're not expecting those people to come up with a business model. Well, you have to do it anyway, uh, but it's anyway, <laughs> it, will be re it, it will be replaced, that's for sure. But they are smarter than that and they, they know if you have societal impact, the impact is potentially huge. And that is a multiple that they're looking for. So I would encourage to really look at these things and probably combinations, as we've seen in HBP. Uh, it is always a combination of technology with some kind of um, uh, medical and, and really go through those barriers and, and do it uh, because we... I mean, this is where the new frontier is. This is where it is. Um, Peter, with, uh, with uh, what he's doing around the, the implants, is, uh, we, we have been working a lot with, uh, with the neurotechnology uh, sector, and I think that's where, really, that's where, where the next boundaries are. There are ethical concerns. There is a lot of barriers there. But this is where it's going to happen. That's where, uh, where the, the, new <laughs> the new big companies are going to be created. Um, I don't know what they look like. I, I, I mean, otherwise I would, I'm, I might be sitting somewhere else eh? <laughs> as soon as I know. <laughs> but yeah, I, I don't think there's clear, there is not a clear winner. It has to be a combination and we come back to it. It is really about how you bring that value and how do you extract sure. that value out of sure. it. And who else to put money on one side or the other? So one of the things that we're seeing, we've seen machine learning a lot in the projects we're supporting. But I think that because of what has happened over the last few months, I think this will boom even more faster, machine learning. We've seen some uh, small acquisitions in uh, image analysis in clinical settings uh, for lung cancer, prostate cancer, breast cancer. But this has been small deals. I think that will grow and there will be bigger and bigger deals. We're seeing a lot of endovascular devices as mm -hmm. well. So this continues the non-invasive or minimally invasive surgery. All VCs love it. Whereas we have some projects that are very solid scientifically that require open surgery. And immediately the market sort of says, okay, this is not minimally invasive. I don't want to even listen to this. We've seen some of these trends. I think in the longer term, we will see a lot of tissue engineering. I think there is a lot of space in neuro for cell reprogramming and to sort of coupling a bit with all the technologies and sequencing, like epigenomic sequencing, uh, you know, RNA, SEC. There's a lot of information coming from that end of things that I've, I believe could be opportunities for neuro, new devices and hybrid tissue and hardware, sort of traditional things. We see lots of opportunities there. Great. You want yeah. Christian? I, I also wouldn't try to decide between the two. Uh, I mean. Uh, neuroscience, biological science in general, uh, if you look at biotech, uh, that's becoming increasingly more data driven. And uh, you need exascale machines for this. And exascale machines, uh, you don't just scale up CPUs or GPUs. So uh, you now have these boost architectures in Unix standing around, which is kind of a three order structure of dedicated compute, basically. And this, you will have a quantum computer in there, we probably have Spinnaker or Intel's Lui in there for different subtasks. So I'm guessing you need the technology also as a driver, as a compute resource. Or um, for, for the neural implants that we're doing, uh, we're doing innovations all over the place. We're working f uh, with partners, of course, from stem cells uh, of, uh, via the algorithms uh, to the chip design to the materials. Uh, you can't disentangle that, basically. To have a really innovative product, and it's probably actually going to be our next startup, um, you, you really need basically the entire chain there. As a data person, this is music to my ears. Stefan, do you want to chime in? Well, I wonder, uh, you, you see, uh, 
here a dialogue between these two, let's say, fields. But these are not two fields. This is one field. We just get accept accept this. This this uh, one is not a tool of the other. Not not is the uh, let's say HPP an application of computer science. Uh, it, it is one new field which has been created. Uh, a marriage from heaven, maybe. Mm -hmm. But th there is no other way out, and there's no easy solution to that. So this is it. That means like, um, uh, I, I don't know if this is now the, the moment where you say, okay, I, I also don't understand why, why people don't look at it as, as one entirety and why they always need to go back to their home turf and then look from the other side. This is a huge overlapping one field, what you, what you, need to, uh, what you need, now need to work with. And um, yeah. Let's, let's take it from there and let's see what happens. They are both mega trends. This is, and we will see much more. I would also like to encourage, you know, uh, there should be much more investments in this direction um, because we need much more, many more people who work on that. That's my opinion. Um, and uh, I, I just hope that the, also the European Union hears that and puts some more money in there. Are you hearing that? <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, is it fair to say that, I mean, I, I like your analogy of, but now this is not new fields, there's a marriage and there's a new field, one field that has come out. Can we be proud of ourselves in HPP, that HPP kind of at least catalyzed, if not, uh, uh, was uh, at the forefront of creating this field? Well, Again, I think you said that before, like going out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. This is very important. And uh, I, I think we as humans are very good in doing that. Um, you um, need to understand, we need new kind of, let's say, understanding that people, um, first of all, people are the most important thing, but well-trained people coming out of this will create with this new basis what we see here and out of this HPP project in the last, I don't know, six, seven years, what happened there? A new kind of science. And now we are here um, in order to, to look. And these people will go out and come up with new ideas, fantastic new uh, computers, fantastic new um, uh, brain science, which comes out there. So um, I, think, I think you can be proud of all the people you produced here in this project. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is this is amazing. I mean, the, the, the young researchers, the young practitioners that we, we've seen over the years. Uh, I mean, more new young people coming in and then the others to bloom and grow and so on. It, it, is, it has been amazing. It has been amazing. Um, there are two horizontal things that I want to uh, ask, touch up a little bit in the, in the uh, seven plus minutes that, that we have. And one, since you talked about people, I, I want uh, Martha to ask you about this uh, as, as our own, our only, unfortunately, other female uh, invitees at the last minute could not make it. Is the innovation landscape in general, but also specifically in the uh, biomedical uh, area, diverse enough, equitable enough, inclusive enough uh, for innovators of all? Uh, demographic characteristics to show up, especially uh, uh, for females. Uh, what, what has your path taught you? <laughs> I did an experiment uh, with this question, uh, thinking uh, about this question uh, in advance, and I asked uh, ChatGPT, what is this? <laughs> and ChatGPT <laughs> said, the innovation landscape is not yet diverse, equitable, and inclusive enough for innovators of all demographic backgrounds to flourish. There are still significant obstacles for women innovators, as well as innovators from other underrepresented groups. But what, somebody can agree or not what uh, ChatGPT does, but I, uh, I'm very critical when I pose a question to ChatGPT. Um, as, as a woman, I can see a lot of progress. There is, there is a lot to do as well, but I can see a lot of progress of women 
uh, leading uh, research programs. I can I can talk about Liz Hare is leading the in the VPHI uh, Institute and the EDIS program. Right. Uh, I can I can give you thousands of uh, uh, examples that women uh, are starting to lead, but doesn't mean that they are uh, compensated by the work as a in equal uh, ranges as a as a man. Yeah. But not we cannot talk. I don't like to talk about a salary, but but a research. Uh, um, uh, has shown uh, as well, uh, studying about that, that the uh, women face many, many uh, challenges in the innovation ecosystems, including gender bias, uh, limited access to capital, a lack of mentorship of networking opportunities, and a sort of shortage of uh, role models, right? So, but the good things to be a woman is that we can adapt uh, very fast a lot, and we can, uh, um, uh, work uh, with the uh, with the less resources than than men. <laughs> than, and certainly than go men. out of your comfort zone. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Thank you. Thank so. you. Anyone wants to comment on this? Uh, the commission is uh, <laughs> working for the EAC, and the commission has some disadvantages. But one of the advantages that when there is policy. A strong policy like this when it gets implemented and we have the power to do this internally quite quickly so for example at the jury interviews with accelerators where we get all these executives presenting the project the jury members i see in many cases a majority female majority from the evaluation side which is very important and we're seeing more and more founders being females and i can i can grasp in the discussion that they bring something new, a new way of doing things. And I think the jury members see the value, we see the value, and I think this is growing really, really fast. As I said, I mean, the commission is not perfect, there are many things we have to improve, but this is one thing that I'm amazed how the commission has moved, and, and this is changing very quickly, at least from our side, where we can decide sure. who is the expert, who is the jury member evaluating. So, yes, this is happening. Christian. Maybe an anecdote, so uh, for spin cloud systems, um, yes, we're not that good. Actually, the four founders are all uh, male. Uh, we, we do have a couple of female employees, so AI engineers, for example. But, uh, for example, the founding team we're now getting together for the neural implants um, for people, uh, actually three of them are female. So, yes, it's, it, ha it is happening, so I would totally support that. Any other comment? Uh, I have to say that my, my, I participate in, in the Human Brain Project from two sides, technical coordination of the medical informatics platform, and the heads of both sub-teams are female, and I'm really proud of them. So, uh, okay, we have less than three minutes. I want to ask something about open science, uh, but, um, and, and, and how it improves innovation or how it hinders innovation, what are the dangers. I'll, I'll put this out for anyone who wants to comment, it, comment on it. And also, any last words of wisdom that uh, anyone may want to, to share. Uh, let, let's go in order. So, Christian, open science and or last words of wisdom for uh, the young and not so young members of the audience how to innovate? So open science, I mean open sourcing stuff or? Open source, open access to yeah. data, open access to, and also I, even the process of research being open. Let's say it's, it's a no-brainer. So uh, especially if you're a young startup, you need access to data, for example, uh, if you're data-driven, if you're AI-driven, and uh, stuff like, I mean, from my perspective, uh, process design, I totally like the risk five, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, initiative at European and German level uh, that that's all open source you get the entire stack and everything because uh, that way you don't have these closed ecosystems you have people startups being able to participate and contribute and also take something away and have also an access to to wider user and end application uh, uh, community basically okay. no-brainer 
within the context of the human brain project. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay, th 30 seconds for every of you on, on whatever you want to talk Well, open, yes, open science is, I think, yeah, a no-brainer, uh, especially now the last, let's say, COVID pandemic years has shown uh, how, how necessary that also is, and we make big strides there. Um, I think also here we need a clear licensing uh, agreement, and, and I, I don't I don't really remember how long, but there's GNU, for instance, and HPC, GNU compiler, all kinds of tools, Apache, and all this coming out there, which is now used for 30 plus years, and we found an agreement there. Again, if you have clear um, regulations and agreements, and everybody knows uh, what to deal with, I think both worlds can, can live with that successfully. Great, great. Steven? Yeah, totally agree. Um, the no-brainer part. <laughs> um, there is a there is a counterside, and eh? that, that is that uh, everything is open, which also um, in some some discussions decreases its value. Um, so that is that is when we talked about uh, innovation and, and creating startups. Value when you start talking to um, um, to investors is an important aspect, and they are looking for that. Um, and it's also not necessarily a, an easier solution for your problem, um, the IP discussion, because even, even in open science and in open source, there is still that discussion. Uh, but on the other hand, it, it is definitely an, um, a way to speed up the whole discussion because we need to bring things together. That's, uh, yeah. So I, uh, I totally agree on that. Enric? Yeah, again, uh, I would agree on the importance of open science. I remember a story about these ORC centers of Hampton, they invented this, rain, this um, uh, amplifier, optical fiber amplifier, and there was a, a joke going around. They lost hundreds of millions. They invented this optical fiber regeneration strategy, and they never patented it, and then everybody used it, like ATAT and so forth. So there is a balance between uh, open science and protecting it. I think we have to be reasonable. So science should be open to everybody to understand how nature works. This is, we are all on board on this, and at some point you need to protect it when you see an, a company opportunity. This is life, unfortunately, so it's a balance there. And just one final comment to the maybe young members of the, of the audience. Uh, if I could think of something, is uh, as it was suggested before, there are many opportunities ahead of you. Academia is just one of them, and joining a startup is another one. Creating your own startup is another one. Uh, joining a big company, being part of this big uh, organization, so many opportunities. I would encourage you to get out of the comfort zone that was also mentioned, and talk to people of all kinds in all areas. Be open because uh, there are many opportunities out there. Again, be open. <laughs> Martha. Yes, I agree a little bit on what uh, uh, my colleagues here mentioned. Uh, open science have uh, two sides, one open and one restricted. Uh, when open science is made by using uh, solution, uh, providing solutions to the market um, um, with a lot of data, um, uh, easy access to the public, uh, uh, but behind that, there is a trade secret uh, uh, like uh, 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 the, the software or, or, or the algorithm that uh, is based on a ne neural network, for example, that, that is not open. <laughs> so we, when, I, when I think on open science, uh, I, I think in those two aspects, right? The, the, the value for the company itself, or if you see, as I mentioned, uh, open AI and ChatGPT, but what you don't know, so you access to the information that ChatGPT can give you, but you don't access to the information on how ChatGPT was built, right? So, and this is, um, this is the other, uh, non-public side of open science. But open science in general can uh, help uh, to innovation, contribute a lot with innovation, and to open the mind of the new generation of researchers as well. So I, I encourage as well a lot uh, to make use of this as, a, as a, a one more tool. And Wonderful. Well, our time is up. Uh, I want to thank all of you for this amazing interaction and discussion. Thank you also for the audience, and uh, let's go out and innovate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martha. <laughs>